All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started in just a moment, but a few announcements before we get underway. We are recording the event and the video will be available on the Basic Science website in a couple of weeks. You'll be able to view this video as well as videos from previous events um, in the series this season and prior seasons. Because of the large number of attendees, we are going to keep the audience muted throughout the event, but we do wanna hear from you. So if you have questions for any of our speakers today, please post them in the chat and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the new Dean of, new-ish Dean of Mathematical and Physical Sciences and Professor of Physics and Astronomy, Steve Kahn. So thank you, Susan. Um, and let me offer my personal welcome. Uh, good evening and welcome to Basic Science Lights the Way. As Susan said, I'm Steve Kahn. I'm the new Dean of the Division of Mathematical and Physical Sciences. And I must say, I'm really pleased to be participating uh, in this event, which is the first time I've, I've participated in, in Basic Science Lights the Way. For almost three years now, this program has been engaging you, our alums and friends, as we showcase the groundbreaking work of our amazing faculty and students. And I hope you are as proud as I am of the phenomenal research taking place at Berkeley and are curious about some of the same questions our scientists are investigating. Uh, before beginning, I thought I'd share just a little bit about myself uh, since I'm new to most of you. Uh, though I recently came to Berkeley from Stanford, uh, my Berkeley roots are actually quite deep. I received my PhD uh, in physics at Berkeley in 1980, and I was a faculty member here in both physics and astronomy during much of the 80s and 90s. Most recently, I was a professor at Stanford and the associate director at uh, Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. Um, I am an experimental astrophysicist, cosmologist, and particle physicist. I recently stepped down as the director of the Vera C. Rubin Observatory in Chile, which is a large national facility under construction with funding from the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. The, this telescope has the largest camera uh, ever constructed on Earth, and it will capture the night sky with a mirror that is 25 feet across and a focal plane that is 3.2 billion pixels. It will make an imaging survey of the entire southern hemisphere of sky, recording the positions, shapes, and time variations of over 20 billion galaxies and 17 billion stars. And I look forward to reporting back to you on the new discoveries that we'll make with Rubin when it first comes on sky in the next two years. Because we have such great telescopes that look at different things in the sky, this era that we're in now is often called the golden age of astronomy. And tonight we're going to discuss one very important new way to view the universe uh, through gravitational waves, or what we sometimes call messengers from deep space. The first detection, uh, direct detection of gravitational waves actually occurred fairly recently in 2015. And it represented one of the most important developments in physics over the last two decades, uh, recognized by the award of the Nobel Prize uh, in physics to Ray Weiss, Kip Thorne, and Barry Barish in 2017. The existence of gravitational waves is a direct consequence of Einstein's theory of general relativity, our modern theory of gravity. However, Einstein himself believed they would be too weak to ever be detectable. In some sense, they are analogous to electromagnetic waves as described by classical electromagnetism. In electromagnetism, electric dipoles, which are sets of two opposite charges uh, that are accelerating, emit electromagnetic waves and make the visible light or other forms of electromagnetic radiation like radio waves, X-rays, and gamma rays. However, because there are no negative masses, Gravitational waves are emitted by accelerating quadrupoles, which are mass distributions that change in shape. And they're described by tensor fields instead of the coupled electric and magnetic vector fields of light. 
This makes the intensity of gravitational radiation much, much weaker. And it therefore takes enormous masses at high acceleration to produce significant energy loss due to gravitational radiation. As such, we primarily expect to detect gravitational radiation from massive compact stars like black holes or neutron stars that are in tight binary systems orbiting one another at high velocities. The emission of gravitational radiation makes these binary systems unstable, and the two stars eventually merge in a cataclysmic event marked by a burst of gravitational waves. The study of such events provides us with crucial information about gravity, about black holes, neutron stars, and the astrophysics of how such systems ever formed in the first place. And you will hear a little about all of those topics from our speakers today. Uh, now I will turn things over to our three inspiring researchers, who also happen to be my colleagues, Urosh Seljak, Rafael Margudi, and uh, Dan Kazin. At the end of each talk, we will uh, aim to address all of the questions from the audience. So please add questions in the chat. And I will remind you that there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. So please don't be shy. Our first speaker is Professor Urosh Seljak. Uros will take some extra time to explain to us all what gravitational waves are and how we measure them. Uros is a professor of astronomy and physics with a specialty in cosmology. His research interests are in theoretical, computational, computational and data analysis in astrophysics and cosmology, and more specifically in cosmic microwave background anisotropies and the large scale structure of the universe. He is developing analytic and numerical models as applied to cosmological observations and data analysis techniques to analyze them. Euros joined Berkeley in 2008, and he is co-director of the Berkeley Center for Cosmological Physics. He received his undergraduate degrees from uh, Ljubljana University in Slovenia, excuse me, Euros, and his PhD from MIT in 2021. Euros received the prestigious Gruber Prize in Cosmology for his important contributions in understanding the cosmic microwave background. So let's uh, let me leave it over to you, Euros. Take it away. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for this nice introduction. Um, let me start. My slides. Okay, so uh, yeah, I will go over some basics of uh, gravitational waves. Um, in particular, I'll focus on LIGO experiment, uh, and then I'll talk about my own research towards the end. So first of all, what is LIGO? LIGO has two sites, uh, one in Louisiana and one in Washington State, and they're separated by about 3,000 kilometers. And what do they do? Um, they Basically, they are interferometers, so they have two uh, uh, arms, uh, each of four kilometers long. And so what they do is they shoot a, a beam of light, they split this beam uh, of light, then they have a mirror and they recombine them back. And uh, if there's nothing along uh, the path that would perturb these beams of light, then we see nothing. But what happens is that if there is, for example, a black hole, black hole uh, event, like a merger, then this um, event will emit gravitational waves, which it, which we can really think of as being simple uh, stretchings of uh, space, but they're stretching of space, which are uh, you know stretching one direction and squeezing in the other direction, such that the air actually doesn't change. And so this is something that we can pick up in this quadruple uh, moment form, as, as Steve mentioned. So when we do this beam splitting uh, recombination um, back, combining the, the light back, that's when we start to see a pattern um if there is an event of uh, gravitational waves um happening for such as black hole black hole merger okay so how sensitive is ligo well extremely sensitive uh it's 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 mind boggling uh the sensitivity of this experiment it measures strains at the level of 10 to the 10 10 to the mi minus 21 so basically the over this path length of uh, you know um two times uh, four kilometers we can measure change in the distance which is 10 times smaller than a proton so this is really incredible and nevertheless uh we would uh we're still limited uh right we would like to do better and here are some some of the sources which limit 
the precision of LIGO. In fact, at low frequencies, uh, these are mostly uh, seismic noise. Um, so you, you think of, I don't know, small earthquakes and things like that. And then at high frequencies, uh, it's uh, basically shot noise, the quantum nature of the light. So, and here's a measurement actually of this noise um, uh, spectrum, as we say, as a function of frequency. And uh, what LIGO tries to do in, uh, is to try to uh, optimize the detection uh, in the regime where the noise is at lowest, which is around here. Okay, so that's one part of, of what goes into data analysis of LIGO. The second part is signal part. So what does the signal look like? Looks like? Uh, basically, we have three, three um, epochs. Uh, first is this um, in-spiral part when, when the two black holes, for example, uh, are rotating around each other and the signal is, is roughly sinusoidal, uh, oscillating, basically up and down. Then we have the merger part, which is a very messy part and where we need uh, supercomputer calculations to actually predict it. And then finally is what we call the ring down uh, part when uh, you know, there are no longer two black holes. There's only one black hole, but it's still slightly perturbed. And these uh, perturbations then uh, decay away via this uh, gravitational wave, wave signal. And that we, we have developed, um, therefore, these kind of templates, as we say, the match templates, which try to predict the form of this signal. You know, first there's oscillation, then, you know, oscillation is, is getting faster and faster. And uh, we call these chirps. And we're trying to match, therefore, um, the signal um, to, the, to the data. So here's an actual real event from 2016. And this is what the theoretical signal looks like, the, basically from the best fit to the data. As, as I said, initially there's this uh, you know, oscillation, oscillatory part, then these oscillations get faster and faster, then there's a merger, which is a messy part, and then there's a ring down when everything goes away. And in terms of frequency, you see there's this frequency dependence where, where frequency keeps going uh, higher, and then it, at the end it really goes fast, uh, fast uh, up um, very fast. Okay, but uh, it's not that simple because there is this noise that I mentioned. And um, here is a typical example of the strain noise. And here's a typical example of the signal. And what we see here is that the signal is much, much uh, smaller than the noise. And so what we try to do is we try to filter out um, the from the data. What we try to do literally is to uh, weight the data by where we expect the signal to be high, and we downweight the data by where we expect the noise to be high. And we do this in frequency space, not in, not in data space. And so this is what, what is called match filter. And uh, here's an example, right, where we have a wave um, um, uh, um, of gravitational waves. Uh, and if it combines with the data, even though we don't see this, this thing in the data, right, it's hidden underneath, but nevertheless, we observe a spike in the data. And so that's, uh, that's what gives us a hint that there was a gravity wave that has traveled through, through our detectors. The second thing is what we want to do is because we have two detectors and they're very far apart, uh, 3,000 kilometers, uh, we don't expect that these various sources of noise will be correlated. We don't expect that uh, the noise will trigger both, uh, both of the detectors because they're so far apart. And so we also demand, therefore, that um, there is a coincidence, basically, of, the, of these triggers of the signal in both detectors at the same time. And so here is an, here's an example, for example, the first event in 2015, where we see very large uh, signals after the filtering. Uh, so these are the two detectors after the filtering, and you see the amplitudes of order, you know, of, of, uh, you know point, point 0.2, point 0.3, um, compared to what the regional data is, which has about a factor of, you know, almost a factor of 10 larger amplitudes, right? And we see almost nothing here, but then we see a, a nice signal once after we have filtered, and we see a coincidence. So again, uh, the, the second event uh, from 2015 is this one here. And um, in, again, uh, what we see here, the signals themselves are much smaller than noise, but A, we can filter such that we see a spike in the signal um, and we demand the coincidence. In other words, the two spikes have to coincide uh, at the same time. And then we declare this a, a real event. Okay, so that's um, that's one thing we can do. But there's another thing we can do. Uh, now, another question is what what is that we can we can learn from this? What we can learn from this is what we call uh, the mass um, uh, of the of the black holes. In fact, the first thing we can learn is what we call the chirp mass, which is some some you know combination of the two masses, essentially proportional to the product of the two masses. That's the the leading effect. But then there are secondary effects uh, which can measure the ratio of the masses, which can measure the spins of these black holes. 
Uh, they can also measure the distance to the to the black hole or the redshift, as we say, and um, and so and of course the other important thing that we can do is we can localize these events where they are in the sky. Okay, so um, what is important, however, is that there are some uh, uncertainties when we try to extract this information. Uh, we're extracting we're trying to extract basically thirteen parameters out of uh, a limited amount of information. And so we cannot do this perfectly. We don't measure all 13 parameters perfectly. And moreover, if the signal is weak, then we'll do you know, considerably worse. And so we'll, we'll find, what we're trying to do, therefore, we're trying to measure an estimate of uncertainty. Um, for example, here uh, I have a plot of uncertainty measure, uh, estimates for the mass, uh, combined mass of the, of the two black holes for the first event, um, uh, which is about 62 um, solar masses. And for the spin, uh, which was about 0.67. In, in this case, both of these are well measured, but you can also see they are correlated, right? And we can see this when we plot two dimensional um, distribution of the errors, and we see that these errors are correlated. And these things get a lot worse if we are dealing with weaker signals. So um, this uncertain quantification is very important. And, and basically, knowing what we have measured is very important when we do this kind of analysis. These analyses are extremely expensive because they, they need uh, these expensive uh, simulations um, uh, and theoretical modeling. Uh, and it often takes days or weeks to perform a, an analysis where we get these kind of uh, plots. All right, then I'll get back to, uh, to why this is important at the end. All right, so um, another thing that is important is to localize where these events are. Um, here is uh, for uh, an example of these first events from LIGO. Um, and they were very poorly localized because we only have two detectors, right? And two detectors actually can basically just determine uh, roughly uh, the position event uh, as a circle. Um, but then if uh, later the third uh, detector came in, the Virgo for, in Europe, and then uh, here's I'm showing a simulated uh, uh, effect of what the Virgo would do on these first events, and we can see that we can localize them a lot better. This uh, localization is also very important and also needs, you know, um, uh, expensive calculations. But the problem is observers actually want this to know this immediately, especially in the in the context of neutron star neutron star mergers, which might have electromagnetic uh, counterparts. And Rafaela will will say a lot more about this and the importance of this localization. Okay, so where are we today in terms of um, detectors? Well, the two LIGO uh, are going strong and Virgo is also uh, helping a lot. Uh, and we are still waiting potentially that uh, for LIGO India, which uh, at this point we're not even certain is going to happen. So this is where we are today um, in terms of uh, what, uh, what LIGO detectors exist. Now, let me say about one thing that is close to my heart because I'm a cosmologist which is that we can uh, use gravitational waves as standard sirens. So not a standard candles, uh, like for example, supernovae are, but standard sirens. What does that mean? Well, it means that um, basically, if we can observe how fast the frequency chirps, as we say, in other words, how fast this frequency is changing um, uh, towards the end of the merger, we're essentially measuring how much energy has been radiated in gravitational waves. And if we compare the amount of energy that's been radiated to amount to the to the strain signal, we're essentially measuring the distance to to this uh, event. So we think we uh, gravitational waves are can, we can measure the the distance very well, and this is what we mean by standard sirens, right? Um, and uh, so the distance is one thing we can measure, but um, what we cosmologists would like to do is we, we like to do redshift distance relation. Uh, to measure the redshift of the galaxy where uh, this uh, event has happened, we need to have electromagnetic counterparts. And again, uh, Rafaela will um, talk about this multi-message astronomy. But now let me just say what we can do uh, if we had both uh, the redshift of the galaxy where this uh, event happened and the distance. Then we can do this redshift distance relation, which is I'm showing here for supernovae, but we can also do the same thing with, with these gravitational waves. And why is this so interesting? It's interesting because we have a controversy today and it's called Hubble tension. And the controversy is that we have two different techniques of measuring this Hubble constant, uh, which is basically the slope of this redshift distance relation. And these two techniques don't agree with each other. We have one technique, which is called the distance ladder, the standard distance ladder technique, which uses uh, a lot of uh, various calibrators from uh, Cepheids to, to supernovae. 
And this distance ladder gives us the number, which is around, let's say, 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec for the Hubble parameter. We also have something which we call inverse distance ladder, which uses uh, cosmological uh, probes, such as cosmic macro background anisotropies and, and galaxy clustering. Um, and this technique, uh, this inverse, inverse distance ladder technique, measures 67 kilometers per second. And there's a large discrepancy between these two. So in principle, gravitational waves could do a lot better, in, especially with neutron star and neutron star uh, events. Now, unfortunately, we only have one. Uh, uh, we have only observed one today, and this one is giving us still a very large errors. And you can see it basically spans both of these events. So this is this uh, curve here. And so right now, we still can't resolve this Hubble tension with gravitational waves. But in the future, if we measure uh, many more of these neutron star and neutron star events, we'll do a lot better. And then finally, on my last slide, I just want to say quick, uh, quickly what our work is about. Our work is to try to make these uncertain quantifications, to try to de determine this localization in the sky and, thing and parameters such as mass and spin to much higher accuracy and much faster. And we have developed a new code, which uh, in, you know, makes uh, these calculations faster by a factor of 40 compared to, to the standard baselines. And this means that instead of hours or maybe in, sometimes even days, of uh, waiting for these calculations, we can do this now in minutes. Okay, and now with this, I'll stop here. So thank you, Yurish. Um, let's see, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so let me start with, uh, does having two LIGO detectors only help reduce seismic noise? How do you minimize the shot noise from photon particles? Well, um, the noise is noise, and and you know uh, you don't necessarily minimize it. But if you have two events that happen at the same time, then two events will be uh, very unlikely uh, to be noise events. Uh, and so we use this coincidence argument to essentially effectively reduce the noise um, when we combine the two to, the two experiments. Okay, thanks. Um, in uh, the interest of time, we have to move forward. So let me turn uh, to our next speaker, uh, who's uh, Professor Rafaela Marguti. Um, Rafaela is the Mark and Christina Benzadun Professor of Astronomy and Physics. Her specialty areas span astrophysics, compact object mergers, like you've been hearing about, core collapse supernovae, gamma ray bursts, neutron stars, radio astronomy, space astrophysics, stellar evolution, supernova shock waves, supernovae, and tidal disruption events. Um, her research is positioned in the new field of what we sometimes call multi-messenger astrophysics with gravitational waves. Raffaella received her undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Milano Bicocca in 2010. She received the 2022 New Horizons and Physics Prize for leadership in laying foundations for electromagnetic observations of sources of gravitational waves and leadership in extracting rich information from the first observed collision of two neutron stars. So tonight, Rafaela will be uh, talking about uh, follow-up electromagnetic observations of gravitational waves. Uh, Rafaela, take it away. Thank you very much, Steve, and uh, thank you very much, Yurosh, for the nice introduction on the gravitational waves. So what I want to share with you today is a little bit of what do we do to try to uh, go after those gravitational wave uh, triggers. So uh, the world of multi-messenger astrophysics that combines photons and gravitational waves is a world uh, that is about violent phenomena in space. So typically we're dealing with stellar explosions, stellar mergers, or something really violent happening in, in the universe. So here um, I am using a cartoon just to emphasize that uh, we have massive stars and when they explode, they live behind neutron stars and black holes. And um, for some of these uh, couples, they can stay there rotate, rotating around each other forever, but they merge. And when they do so, they produce the gravitational waves that you just talked about. And what I want to discuss with you is our efforts to try and find light emitted by these mergers. In this world of multi-messenger astrophysics, we do have many open questions uh, that we are trying to address. But today with you, I would like to focus on how do these compact object mergers look like uh, in the in light? Uh, what is their 
um, what are their photons, basically? So why now is a good time to go uh, and try to solve this question? So I'm going to give you two points. And the first is very much about a technological revolution that is related to uh, the fact that we do have the technology to take pictures of the sky uh, night after night. And, and then we ask the question, what was not there last night that is there tonight? And here I'm emphasizing on the slides, um, two surveys uh, that you see uh, Berkeley professors are involved with, uh, YSC, the Young Supernova Experiment that I helped um, funding, uh, the ZK Transient Facility, but also looking at the future, I also wanted to, uh, to emphasize the Vera Rubin Observatory that Steve already introduced, and this is where also UCB faculties are play, uh, playing a, a huge role. So uh, this is not all. Uh, we are actually putting together, uh, as we speak, actually a new time domain survey that will be in the southern skies. It will be at La Silla. Uh, that is called LS4, the PI Peter Nugent at LBNL. And this is uh, our discovery machine. Uh, and you will understand what I mean uh, in just uh, a few minutes. So what have we been doing with these new machines, with these new capabilities to really map the fourth dimension, the time uh, dimension? Um, what have we been doing? So as every single time we have new capabilities, we can find and explore new parts of parameter space of things that we already knew uh, they existed. And here I'm using a, a typical supernova. Right now we can actually sample uh, the red line basically, and that's how we discovered that stars are not quiet before death, but they go through a number of eruptions, for example. But of course, every single time we have a new capability, we find things that we were not even aware they existed. And uh, here I use as, a, uh, as an example, uh, these types of transients that we call like fast transients and superluminous uh, supernovae. This is just to emphasize that whenever we can uh, do things on different time scales and whenever we can point uh, and look in different parts of the universe, we always find something new. And this is extremely relevant right now because with gravitational waves, we are opening a completely new window of exploration in the universe. And this touches upon my second point. So uh, we have the possibility to do studies that combine not only photons, not only light, but we can combine that with neutrinos, we can combine uh, them with gravitational waves that you were uh, nicely introduced. So the first point is giving us discovery power. We can find new things. And these multi-wavelength, multi-messenger studies allow us to understand the physics uh, that is going on. So we can uh, really build understanding. So put together discovery power and understanding, that's a good way uh, to make progress uh, in a field. So how uh, do, did we know uh, that gravitational waves uh, actually existed? So this is something that we have been suspecting for a long while. And being an observer, I always go back and see what the universe is telling us with data. And what you have there is a plot where you have on the x-axis, you have a measurement of the distance of two neutron stars that are rotating around each other. And then on the x-axis, you have the year, literally the calendar year. And what you can see is that these two neutron stars are getting closer and closer with time. And they are doing, not only they're doing that, but they're doing so in a way that is very much consistent with the predictions of the Einstein theory of general relativity. So this is why we were quite sure uh, that gravitational waves, which are a prediction of this theory, uh, had to exist. So that's why uh, we had this, uh, um, um, this safety in mind that uh, LIGO was built with the idea that these gravitational waves uh, existed. So uh, this takes us to the discovery of gravitational waves in 2015 introduced by Eurush. And what you see there are those wiggles uh, that Eurush uh, explained already. And uh, you can see, now I'm going to play a little video about how uh, these uh, ripples uh, evolve. And then focus your attention on that event that I called GW170817, which happened in 2017. And what you're seeing there is uh, the gravitational wave signal. So it doesn't take much time to realize that uh, this signal from 17 wave 17 is very different from anything else that, I, uh, that, we have seen, that we have seen before. And the reason is that while all the other signals that I plotted above are from the merger of two black holes, 17 wave 17 comes from two neutron stars. 
And um, what is happening is that we have two, these two neutral stars that are rotating around each other. And at some point uh, they will merge and they're gonna maybe be able to actually hear the chirp uh, as it happens. And it's about to happen. And that's a merger. That's a chirp. You, we could actually hear it. We can actually hear it with our own uh, ears. OK, so uh, that is uh, what we're talking about, is the merger of two neutron stars. And uh, they formed a new object that uh, we still don't know what it is. It's most likely a new black hole. This is the picture of all the our knowledge of these black holes, these neutron stars, that dated back to 2017. Now I'm going to move on to the 2022 picture. And as you realize uh, very quickly, uh, the picture became much richer on a very short time scale. This is uh, just to tell you uh, how the gravitational wave world is really uh, a field that is in rapid expansion. So all of these dots that you see on this plot, those are two uh, in, in blue are two black holes that are, uh, that are merging in orange. Those are neutron stars that are merging. So these are all the mergers that LIGO has seen so far. So how do we play this game? So how does it work on a day-to-day -day life? What do we do? So once upon a time, uh, a discovery engine for an observer like me would consist of telescopes only. So we would use our telescope, you find a new transient, and then uh, you uh, decide to study deeper with your, uh, with your other uh, instruments. Right now, that is no longer enough, and you have to actually add some artificial intelligence, some help uh, from computers. But for gravitational waves, it's actually way more difficult than that. And Yurush has already um, alluded to that part. So Yurush has showed you how big the localization regions are from gravitational wave instruments. So typically what happens is that LIGO Virgo, this uh, instrument, gravitational wave instruments, tell us that something has happened. And that thing happened in a large part of the sky that here uh, I'm uh, picturing with this uh, gray uh, contour. And then what we do is, well, we start tiling with our telescopes this area of the sky, and then we ask ourselves, what is new now that wasn't there two hours ago? And then we find a number of things in this error region. Why? Because the universe, in the universe, nothing is stable. Everything is, is evolving, so we keep finding new things. And then the big question is, uh, we have so many potential counterparts of, to this gravitational wave event because I don't know exactly where that happened. And the question is, what is the counterpart uh, to this gravitational wave uh, source? And that's what I do with my team is to try to understand which of these potential counterparts is the right one. So. This is the world uh, of following up gravitational wave sources. And only after you found one, what we do is to trigger all the facilities that we can put our fingers on. Here I'm listing some satellites, a radio antenna, optical telescopes. And we do so we, because we want to understand the physics of what is going on. But to do so, we need to know where to point. So why, uh, why uh, we go through all of these troubles? Why multi-messenger astrophysics is so appealing right now? Well, the reason is that as Yurosh explained, gravitational waves tell you a lot about the properties of those events, of those two neutron stars or black holes that are emerging. They are telling you how massive mm -hmm. these things were, how fast they're rotating these things were. But once you get uh, to the point of the merger, well, then the signal goes outside our range of sensitivity uh, of gravitational wave events and the signal is lost. This is where light comes into play. Light allows us to understand what happens after the gravitational waves are over. So just to summarize, an easy way to think about multi-messenger astrophysics with gravitational waves right now is that gravitational waves tell you everything about what those things were before the merger, and we use the light to understand what did we produce. And the reason why this is so important is because this has broader impacts on our capabilities to understand the behavior of matter in extreme uh, physical conditions that are not achievable on Earth. And also it allows us to do uh, cosmology, as Yurish um, uh, alluded. So I'm going to use my last few minutes uh, just to say, just to give you an idea of what we did for the only event for which we were able to find 
light and gravitational waves. There is only one, and that happened on August 17th, uh, 2017. So it's 6 a.m. on Earth. I'm going to give you Pacific times. So we, we received the alert. And that's a map uh, at the bottom. You can see the map of the gravitational wave signal. And after two seconds, uh, we also detect some gamma rays. So we look at the maps. We receive, we observers, uh, we receive the maps. And in this case, the map uh, that LIGO gave us consisted of those two green bananas. And then the map of the gamma ray uh, instrument consisted of the blue uh, shaded parts. And then we overlap them and we find the region where most likely the signal was coming from. And that uh, region is still large, is 28 degrees squared. And let me quantify it. Think about it, a full moon is like 0.5 degrees. And this allows you to uh, picture in your mind how big of an area it is. For astronomical standards, it's really huge. It's a lot of area to cover and a lot of things can happen there. So we waited for the sun uh, to set. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, during the day, so we had to wait uh, and we got ready. And half an hour, just half an hour after sunset, um, Ryan, who is now uh, here uh, at Berkeley, sent his email uh, to our collaboration saying, uh, holy cow, I found something really, really uh, great. Uh, and here is what Ryan uh, found. This is the galaxy. Nothing was there one day before. And here you go. There is a new source. And what you're looking at there is the first counterpart uh, with light of a gravitational wave uh, source. So last slide to say, where do we go? Uh, so after five years, uh, after 2017, uh, we have only found one. We only have one a celestial object for which we're able to find light and gravitational waves. We want more. So LIGO is going to restart in March uh, 2023, and we're getting ready uh, to try and find more of these counterparts. We want more to understand how these mergers uh, happen. Not only we want more neutron star mergers, but my hope is that we're gonna find light the, for the first time from a black hole and neutron star merger. And there is a lot of activity going on uh, behind the scenes about uh, how to get ready. And um, if you're interested, please uh, please ask me, I'll be very happy to address that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Rafe. Um, we're running a little bit uh, short on time. So um, let me just ask one question. Um, why is it that we only have one such one event when you showed that there are a bunch of other neutron star, neutron star mergers? The short answer is that while we started detecting gravitational waves only in 2017, the capabilities of the gravitational wave interferometers are now um, outpacing uh, the, uh, the way that the, the electromagnetic instruments are growing. So basically, they find events that are too far away for our telescopes to see any light. Great, thanks very much. Okay, let's now turn to our last speaker who is uh, Dan Kazin. Um, Dan is a professor of astronomy and physics at Berkeley with a specialty area in theoretical and computational astrophysics uh, with an emphasis on supernovae, neutron star mergers and other energetic transients. He uses multi-dimensional supercomputer simulations to study astronomical explosions and their applicability as probes of cosmology and fundamental physics. More generally, he is interested in radiation transport across a range of astrophysical environments. Dad, Dan did his undergraduate work at Stanford and he got his PhD here at Berkeley. He joined the Berkeley faculty in 2010 and in 2020, Dan was given the Ernest O. Lawrence Award from the Department of Energy for his pioneering contributions in multi-messenger astrophysics. So Dan is going to talk to us about computational modeling and extracting the physics from these cosmic events. Take it away, Dan. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, yeah, we just heard some really nice talks about the kind of uh, messages we can get from these events uh, from deep space. I want to say a little bit about how we can uh, try to interpret those to say something about what's going on in these events using theory and simulation. Uh, these kind of stellar explosions that we're talking about 
uh, well, they reach extremes in density, gravity, energy, uh, unlike anything that we could uh, produce on Earth. So they're really fascinating laboratories to explore uh, physics at the extreme. Uh, and they're also important players in the you know, story of the universe and the story of ourselves. Uh, they shape the galaxy and uh, the next generation of stars. Uh, and they produce the environments where we think most of the elements uh, were formed. So the story of origins of where uh, all the stuff of the solar system and ourselves came from uh, ties into these questions of stellar events. Uh, if you look at the periodic table of the stuff we encounter uh, in daily life, uh, there's a really rich uh, bunch of stories to tell about how uh, they came into existence uh, through stars and stellar explosions. Uh, only the lightest elements uh, were produced in the Big Bang. Uh, other uh, elements were produced in uh, potentially massive stars exploding as supernova, detonating white dwarfs merging neutron stars and perhaps other things. And we're still trying to tell the full story of how that happened, uh, when and where it happened. Uh, and uh, especially for the heavier elements, uh, getting a, a complete sense of, of the physics involved. Um, and uh, so this is where the observations that Raf just talked about are, are really providing breakthroughs in, in our understanding of this, uh, this origin story. And so how can we understand what's going on in these uh, events? Uh, well, we can't do experiments uh, at scale on Earth, but uh, we can do virtual experiments in a sense on, on computers through simulation. Um, basically try to take all the physics that's involved in stellar explosions uh, and try to uh, solve uh, solve it. Now, what physics is that? Well, it's essentially the, you know, the entire uh, Berkeley major uh, curriculum here. It's gravity, Einstein's general relativity, hydrodynamics and electromagnetism, thermodynamics, nuclear reaction, electromagnetic radiation and particle physics uh, all happening uh, at once. And so you can kind of get a sense from this uh, subset of the equations involved, it's more than one could uh, try to solve at the blackboard. So we got to put this on a lattice and try to solve it with um, computers. And um, uh, that's a, a, a challenging uh, problem. Uh, and really at the leading edge of, of, you know, trying to model complex systems. Can we take a, a you know, multifaceted nonlinear system like this and actually understand what's going on and make predictions of how it may behave? Uh, interesting problem in, in many areas uh, beyond astrophysics. And so, you know, we address these with uh, computers, but it was actually supercomputers. So these are machines that are built of chips like you might have in your laptop, but you assemble cabinets of them so that you have hundreds of thousands or millions of computing cores. And you take those uh, equations that I showed before and, and divide it up among this army of, of processing units and then try to assemble it back up at the end. And uh, that's a big challenge that we're working on. We have uh, I mean, benefit from great resources here at Berkeley and, and com computer scientists, and mathematicians, and 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 uh, in machinery, and we're part of this exascale computing project now, for, uh, funded by the D, uh, Department of Energy, that's trying to stand up the largest supercomputers ever. Uh, Exa stands for ten to the eighteen, so a billion billion calculations per second uh, done by these machines, which is orders of magnitude uh, more than we uh, where we were at, you know, five or so years ago. Uh, and um, we're working to build the astrophysics codes that can run on these machines, which should be available in about a year. Um, and we, you know, we can start to do simulations such as this. This is a work by a, a postdoc at Berkeley, David Vartanian, zoomed in on the core of a massive star that's run out of fuel and is collapsing into a, a neutron star. And that energy of the collapse produces a really hot, dense nugget that's uh, basically blasting its environment with high energy particles. So uh, mainly neutrinos that are then driving uh, a blast wave that will um, expand and, and basically disrupt the entire star that's above uh, this, uh, this movie frame. And so you see these plumes running out. Um, there's nuclear synthesis going on and iron and calcium and titanium being formed. Uh, and, uh, you know, this question of how stars die and explode has been around since the 1950s. And it's really been now where we can start to do, you know, detailed three-dimensional simulations like this, where we're starting to see successful explosions and start to answer questions about how is it that stars die and elements are formed? 
uh, and what are the signals we can get. Um, we can calculate gravitational waves from those supernova, but you get stronger gravitational waves when you have two neutron stars or two black holes merging. And here's a simulation by another Berkeley postdoc who Adam Peterson, who worked on uh, developing code to solve Einstein's equations of general relativity on computers. And in here, just visualizing what, what you wouldn't be able to see, the curvature of space-time, which is black holes orbiting each other and, and um, stirring up the space-time around them and, and sending out these ripples of gravitational waves. And, and, uh, and uh, we can generate these gravitational wave signals that you have talked about, uh, say how they uh, would depend upon the mass and uh, spins and other properties of the black holes. Also explore how changes uh, to the fundamental physics of alternatives to general relativity may change uh, some of these uh, signals and how we can explore that. Um, black holes are great, but they don't produce any light, so we want to see the light. It's more interesting to talk about merging uh, neutron stars, two neutron stars, or a neutron star in a black hole, like this simulation done by a, a former uh, Berkeley postdoc, who's now at University of uh, New Hampshire, uh, showing this neutron star in green orbiting a black hole, moving around uh, near the speed of light. And even though neutron stars have very strong gravity, it can't match the tidal forces of this black hole, which kind of rips it apart, uh, swallows a bunch of the neutron star, but uh, a few percent of the mass of the neutron star gets kicked out in a, in a cloud. And that's the stuff we're really excited about. Um, this is just an artist's renditions of what that radioactive cloud may look like, uh, expanding at a few tenths of the speed of light, but we can actually predict with some detail what kind of elements would be formed there. It's, it's strange stuff. You've just taken this exotic neutron-rich matter in the neutron star and liberated it out into space, and the neutrons capture and, and form heavy elements. In fact, the heaviest elements on the periodic table, gold, platinum, silver, maybe hundreds of Earth masses of these precious metals. Uh, um, unfortunately, if you want to mine them, they're, they're kind of embedded in a, in a bunch of radioactive waste too, plutonium, uranium, europium, uh, even berkelium, uh, one of the heaviest elements discovered here at Berkeley produced in some amount. Um, and so we have this big cloud of, of radioactive waste and you know from comic books and stuff that radioactive waste uh, glows. And when you have 10,000 earth masses of radioactive waste, it glows bright enough to be seen uh, across the universe. And that's the, the signal that, that Raph was just talking about that they discovered in 2017. Even prior to that, we had done simulations to predict what we might see if, if such an event happened. And here's an example, one of those calculations uh, on the right is kind of showing you a cartoon of you know, this cloud structure, but on the left is a, you know, actual detailed physics calculation of what the spectrum of light would look like. And in these things that started out rather bright and blue and then started to fade and cool and turn red and the heavier elements that concentrated in the core gave rise to a very strong red and infrared emission. And the features in the spectrum here can tell us about kinematics, the speeds involved and the elements involved as well. So we had some picture of what um, such a strange uh, radioactive cloud uh, might look like. In 2017, Raf showed how they incredibly found the light from that neutron star merger, and we were able to follow it up, and we were able to see uh, if we could understand it and compare the actual predictions of the simulations and theory to, to the observations. And we get some picture like this, that over time, we predict the, the uh, blue light would fade away quickly in about a, in a couple of days, and the red light would last longer for maybe weeks, uh, and with a brightness and color that matched actually quite well with the observation. So this is sort of a, a triumph of simulation that uh, you could take a complex system like this and actually uh, make sense of it and and uh, be able to understand the uh, thing you uh, when you first when you first saw it. And we can use that information and these fits to tr extract how much. Um, material was expelled in the event and what its rough composition was. Uh, and the conclusion from those analyses are that the looks like, you know, a large amount, maybe most of the heavy elements, heaviest elements in the universe were produced in these kind of neutron star mergers, including, you know, the gold uh, ring on your finger. And so what happens of it? Well, that debris cloud, you know, disperses among the galaxy and, and 
uh, forms into gassy clouds and, and seeds the next generation of stars, like in this beautiful picture from James Webb showing a region of star formation in the galaxy, uh, new stars forming, um, uh, enriched by the ashes of the, the old explosions. And that cycle will, will repeat until you have more and more enriched stars and, and planets around them. Um, and so with these kind of observations, we're getting closer to be able to tell that story and explore some of the physics involved. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to the more events to try to understand what we're uh, seeing in more detail and maybe see some surprises of things that we we don't expect and we don't understand and uh, new questions being raised. So thank you. So thank you, Dan, for a fascinating talk. So let me just ask one question and then we'll bring back the rest of the speakers. Um, have we accounted for all the heavy elements now? Do we understand uh, how all the heavy elements were produced or uh, are there still mysteries there that are not understood? Uh, on the rough scale, we we think we do. I mean, this the the heaviest elements of these uh, gold and platinum and so are was the real mystery, and with the neutron star merger event, uh, it was sort of a breakthrough of understanding that that could produce all of uh, all of them. Now, on a detailed scale, it's hard to extract you know every single element being produced in these events, and there's still puzzles in in particular about you know certain elements of isotopes of copper or zinc or other things where we might need more exotic environments to produce them. Uh, there's questions of, of how those materials got mixed around and, and how they enrich stars. So there's, there's no end of the kind of puzzles of individual elements uh, being produced. Um, whereas the, you know, the global picture is starting to come into view, but there's uh, there's lots of sub-questions to ask. And the number of expected number of neutron star, neutron star merges, mergers is commensurate with the abundances we see of the heavy elements? Yeah, that's what it looks like. So the neutron star mergers are pretty rare. I mean, they happen in a galaxy one every 10,000, 100,000 years much less frequent than supernova, but they actually produce a pretty large amount of these uh, heavy elements. And so um, if you just estimate, we only have one event, but if you say, well, that's typical, the amount of material we inferred from it and the, the rate at which uh, these things happen, which again, we don't know that well because we only have one event, but if you just do those numbers, it seems like we, we produce enough uh, to explain most of uh, the heavy elements in the, in the galaxy. But that's something we'll be testing in a lot more detail with, with future observations. Okay, great. Let's bring back the other two speakers and just some general questions. So can you bring Raf and uh, and Yurush in? Uh, thanks. So just one question came from the audience. Can maybe Yurush, you can take this. Can gravitational waves self-propagate uh, analogous to electromagnetic waves? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, self-propagating, I, mean, I assume um, it means whether the wave can propagate through the universe, uh, and the answer is yes, and in fact it propagates with the speed of light, the gravitational waves propagate with the speed of light at the same speed as the electromagnetic waves, and, and basically a wave means that it propagates, right, um, so in that sense they are similar. Um, but you know, to, to answer this other question, which is in what in what uh, way they are different from electromagnetic waves. Or, or light, it's that they really are uh, stretching uh, the space itself, right? Um, and, the sp and the stretching is such that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the area remains the same, but it, so it's, you know, it has to be stretching one direction uh, you know, positively and the other direction negatively so that the area remains the same. And that's what we call this uh, uh, quadrupole uh, type of stretching. Uh, and it's really very different from electromagnetic wave in that sense. And uh, so let me ask to all of you, um... This is pretty esoteric stuff that you guys are doing. Is it possible to involve students uh, in this research or uh, how has that worked? Are Berkeley undergraduates getting exposed to this stuff? Maybe Raf, you wanna start? Yeah, so actually from an observational perspective, uh, it takes some personality, but uh, it can be very exciting because you don't know when the trigger happens. And the way we get it is through an app. And by the way, if you want to know what the LIGO is seeing, uh, there is an app that you can download, it's the LIGO app. So starting from March, you can be part of this game. So you get the alert on your 
phone. It can be night, it can be day, it can be vacation, it can be any time. And then you get you need to get into action and repoint your telescopes. And that's something that uh, the students uh, typically like. Uh, and yes, uh, they love doing that. And Dan and Hirosh, have you guys involved students in, in your research? Yeah, yeah, there's lots of students uh, involved. And uh, um, yeah, I think you can jump into, uh, yeah, with, with some basic computing knowledge, you can jump into you know running some of these simulations and doing these visualizations and understand, and then build the kind of uh, depth of physics that uh, that is involved in it. And uh, um, yeah, there's lots of exciting sub problems to work on. Uh, so students are yeah, very heavily involved. So yeah. just two, two more quick. Oh, yours. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no. Same here. Same here. Yeah, students are definitely very involved. Yes. Uh, two quick questions. Um, does dark matter or dark energy affect these observations based on unexpected acceleration away from us or redshifting? Uh, maybe you're you want to take that. Well, I mean, most of these uh, events are still at, well, relatively low redshift, but uh, I mentioned this this uh, Hubble diagram, which is a redshift distance relation, and at, at larger redshifts, then we would we would uh, start to observe that this redshift distance relation is not a linear relation anymore, and so in that sense, we would start uh, observing uh, the acceleration of the universe, um, just like uh, this has been observed with supernovae. We're not there yet, just because we only have one neutron star neutron star merger, but you know, in the future, we may actually be able to see dark energy directly, even, even in gravitational wave events th themselves. Okay, and one final question I really like. I barely understand any of this, but I'm curious if in these observations and analysis, whether you've encountered any completely unknown phenomena or unexpected phenomena as yet. Anybody want to take that? I would say that uh, yes, the answer is yes. I have to say that the theorists did a fantastic job. Um, so kudos to the theorists. But I have to say that now, after five years after the merger, uh, we are detecting still some light from that single neutron star, neutron star event. And now there are some deviations. And as an observer, I like when the theory doesn't do a good job. <laughs> That's great. Okay, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Yurush, uh, Raf, and Dan uh, for helping us understand what gravitational waves are and, uh, and how they can uh, inform us about the universe. Um, though my own career has through, uh, been exploring similar questions to tonight's presenters, um, I can't help but be personally inspired by the really important discoveries and the opportunities to answer big questions in this field. It's a very exciting time, and I hope uh, today's event has sparked your curiosity and left you with some science questions to ponder. Uh, I thought I'd leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein, uh, because it's so relevant to this astrophysics and cosmology and this series. Uh, the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when one contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. Is an, it is enough if one tries to comprehend only a little of this mystery every day. Uh, with that, uh, let me thank you for uh, joining us today and encourage you to reach out if you'd like to learn more about anything we've covered. Uh, we'll be sharing additional resources with you by email about today's topic and our speakers, and a video of today's session will be available at our Basic Science Lights the Way website uh, approximately uh, one week from now. Uh, so we look forward to seeing many of you uh, uh, at our last Basic Science Lights the Way event, uh, Invisible Science, which will occur on November 10th. Uh, until then, stay curious, fiat lux, and go bears. Thanks very much for coming.